Grace and peace to you in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. We welcome you to this worship service here at Quaker Memorial Presbyterian Church. Whether you're here in person or watching it as it live streams um, over Twitch or Facebook, we're delighted that you are a part of this service this morning. I want to extend an especially warm welcome for those who may be visiting with us for the first time. Um, I am Nancy Dawson. I'm the interim pastor here at Quaker Memorial, and we welcome you. I'm glad you found us and tuned in. Um, may your worship service on all of our worship together be uplifting and encouraging to each of us as God is glorified and honored and praised. A number of uh, announcements to make. Our regular prayer time will be Wednesday from 6 to 7. You'll receive a list <clears throat> via the email, sorry, <clears throat> as to uh, some of the items that we want to lift up and remember. And um, if you want to join with someone else, then feel free to get in touch with them and make that happen. Um, next Sunday, we will be celebrating communion and there will be packets here for folks who show up in the sanctuary uh, attending in person. If you're going to be watching online, just use whatever you have at home. That seems appropriate. Um, Glenn Klingon Peel, who passed away about a month ago, or maybe longer, um, her funeral is going to be on July the 9th which is Thursday at 11 o'clock here in the sanctuary. Um, the committal will be at the columbarium and you'll have the opportunity to greet the family and, and have some um, appropriately socially distanced visitation time um, out under the trees. Hopefully um, it'll be a relatively cool day and we'll have some water out there. Unfortunately, we can't do a full um, reception just because it just doesn't seem to work. Um, on another joyful note for whatever God is up to with Clyde and Sarah Harkraver and Joni and Clyde, but a sad note for us, um, they are going to be moving and we will greatly miss them and have been blessed by their ministry here, not just the music ministry, but getting to know the whole family and all the ways in which they're involved, have been involved in the life of the church. They will be back to say goodbye. Uh, we're working on that. So um, prayers for them as they uh, prepare their house to go on the market. And as Clyde continues to look for work, um, Sarah has been offered a position and um, they're gonna be living with his folks for a while until life settles down. So. As I often say, I don't always like what God is doing, but I trust what God is doing. And so I trust that God is mightily at work in your life and we will miss you greatly. As we gather to worship and glorify God and prepare to pass the peace in the tradition of the ancient church, I'm gonna suggest again that this side um, say to the left side, may the Peace of Christ be with you and also with you over to the other side as you are seated. So let us share the peace of Christ. The peace, peace of Christ, Christ be with, with you and also with you. Let us prepare our hearts to worship God.
Sing praises to the Lord who dwells among us. Who declare his deeds among the people. The Lord is the one who lifts us up. We rejoice in the deliverance of God. God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who gives us birth by water and Holy Spirit, Teach us how to live always in integrity of body, mind, and spirit, in obedience to your love, in the name of Jesus Christ, to whom, with you and the Holy Spirit, be all honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. <laughs> with God. The price of sin is a spiritless life, which is no life at all. Where are joy, peace, or lasting love to be found, except in the one who creates peace and joy, who sent Jesus Christ, the beloved Son, to save us from our sin. Let us confess, repent, and trust God to forgive us our sin. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Loving God, you know our hidden thoughts and deeds. You judge us in our disobedience and lack of faith. We fail to trust you and your promises and believe our ways are better than yours. Our sins not only injure ourselves, but also hurt other people. Forgive us, O oh God, and lead us in your will and way. Amen. Please take a moment for silence personal confession and reflection. Uh, 
Amen. God, whose name is I Am, provides for our weakness. Jesus Christ, I Am in the body, gave himself for our salvation. All who are united to Christ in his death are united to Christ in his resurrection. The end is eternal life. I declare to you, in Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Listen to the word of God. I will be reading from Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. He said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering, and set out, and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out, on, reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its thorns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. This is the word of the Lord.
Before we turn to God's word, let us turn to God in prayer. Gracious and holy God, you do give us beautiful and wonderful words that lift our hearts and give us hope even when days are dark and difficult and confusing. You lead us and you call us to trust in you. So may we hear this passage this morning again in new ways that you might be glorified and that our spirits might be lifted in glory to you. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Our second reading this morning comes from Romans, chapter 6, verses 12 through 23, and it begins with the words, therefore. Therefore suggests that what was said before has an impact on what is to be said next. I would suggest that as we figure out what the therefore is that Paul is writing about, uh, that we look back to chapter 5, verse 1, since, and he begins with, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. Chapter 6, verse 1, the beginning of our chapter for today says, I ask the question, should we continue in, in sin in order that grace may abound? In other words, if grace abounds, should we just sin even more? And Paul answers his own question with, absolutely not. We are united in Christ in his death and resurrection and therefore are united in him in grace. And that is the point that Paul is trying to make. Listen now for God's holy word. <clears throat> therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourself to God as those who have been brought from death to life, and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you have you, that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity, and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you have then get from the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin, and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The passage in Genesis that Olivia read for us this morning starts with, after
after these things, Hagar and Ishmael have been sent away. The child that Abraham had with his wife's maidservant, the child that was not the child of the covenant, was um, sent away because of jealousy and fear. Abraham also in that time frame made a promise with a neighbor about the rights to a well. Now that might sound a little silly to us in our day because all we do is go in the kitchen or the bathroom and turn on the tap and there it is. But they had to dig these wells and sometimes they went down quite a distance and actually had a series of steps that went along the outside to uh, go down and come back up. And if you had a lot of camels and animals and you had a lot of people in the household, that was a lot of trips. And you wanted to know that that well was gonna be there with water that you could use. Then we're told after many years had passed that God tested Abraham. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time with the notion that God tests us I know that the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tested. I know that the disciples were tested when they were in the boat in a storm in the middle of the lake. I know that the disciples were also tested when they were asked to provide food to the multitudes in terms of loaves and fishes. And they were tested in the garden when they were there with Jesus and asked to pray for him and his upcoming trial. God loves us. God gave us free will. So what is the purpose and the point of being tested? Now in school, a test is a measure of both the teacher's ability to teach and the student's ability to learn. In military or sports or business, it's a measure of what someone is capable of. In our faith, God's testing is about trusting God to be God. Often it is said, and I, this happens to me all the time, when I pray for patience, I get to practice patience. And it's like, no God, that's not what I had in mind. Don't make me do this. Testing is an opportunity to practice our free will and whether or not we trust God to be God and to be a God who is loving and gracious and good. Especially when the test is hard, when it makes no sense, when it scares us and seems impossible. This has definitely been the case during the pandemic and in the life of this congregation, as we have had so many members go on to eternity. And that's hard on a small church. And as we leave well-beloved members whom God is calling to go to the place that I will show you, ironically that they did that skit just a few months ago, and here it becomes true. Um, testing also, is a part of the fear that comes with the, the threat of the illness. And it's a unique disease that we are still learning a lot about and don't know and don't have the tools to deal with. Loss of jobs, as has happened to a number of our members, and a decline in incomes, tests that tell us to stay home and for us extroverts, we don't like that. The test to wear masks or to wash our hands or to social distance from one another or tests that interrupt our plans from everything from vacations to weddings to graduations. This time of testing has not been easy. Coupled with the violence that is going on in this country and the civil unrest that we experience I want to yell out to God, Uncle, time out, enough, give us a break, let me catch my breath. Genesis says that Abraham's testing 
was also unimaginable. Genesis says, God said to Abraham, Abraham? And Abraham's response was, here I am. And God said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show to you. Can you imagine? In scripture, there's no response from Abraham. No words, no hint of emotions, just action. The author, Ralph Milton, wrote in his book titled, Is This Your Idea of a Good Time, God? Says he offers insights into what the conversation between God and Abraham just might have been like. God said, Abraham, you never promised me that it would be easy. You promised Sarah and me a new land to live in. You promised we'd be forebearers of a great, vast multitude of people, but you did not promise that it would be easy. I know it takes time, Abraham said, and you sent us Isaac after lo these many years, and oh, what a son he is, God, what a son he is, my fine boy, my Isaac. And you said it was through Isaac that Sarah and I would be ancestors of a whole race of people. Look at the stars, you said, God. Do you remember you said that? Of course you remember you said that. So I looked at the stars, but I still can't count that far. Still, that would be a lot of folks, God. Can you handle that many? I mean, just with Sarah and me and our little tribe, you had your hands full, right? If you make as many people as there are stars, can you pay attention to all of them? Or are you gonna be a little easier on them now? Because life is not an easy thing, you know, God. Maybe you don't understand how tough it is. You're God, so for you, things are easy. I'm just a human being. You made me out of dust, remember? Aren't you expecting a bit much from a walking lump of dust, God? All right, I know. You've always delivered on your promises. But God, why this? It makes no sense. No sense at all. I could deal with the challenge when you told me to pack up my family and leave home and go to a country that you would show us. Fine, I dealt with that, I did that. And granted, we had to wait a long time before you delivered on a child you promised. Oh, such a child. Oh, what a beautiful boy with his mother's dark eyes. And they say, he has my nose. It's a good nose for a man. And we laughed when we heard he was coming. Sarah and I, we laughed so hard. And so we named the boy Isaac, which means laughter. Did you know that, God? Of course you knew that. So now, why this? Why this? On the one hand, you told us we would become a great nation through Isaac. On the other hand, here I am walking up a mountainside with my beloved son beside me under your orders to make a sacrifice of him. You have told me to put my own son on an altar and to kill him there as a sacrifice to you. What I hear in your request, God, is if you love me, Abraham, if you trust me, you will do this. Take the boy up the mountain and make a human sacrifice out of him. I know, I know that's what you said, but he's my boy, God. Have you any idea what it might be like to watch your own child die? 
especially when he's innocent. He hasn't done anything wrong. I've done wrong. I mean, you know what I've done and how I've messed up, but is my son to die for my sins? Yes, I believe you, God. I trust you, but I don't understand. And I wonder if you really understand what it's like to be a parent. Maybe you should try it sometime, God. Then you might know what it's like to love a child more than anything in the world, and then to have your child taken from you. All right already, I'm sorry. You're God, you know what you're doing. You told me to go and sacrifice my son, and so here I am. Isaac, my son, I love you with my whole life. I know you will not understand what I'm going to do. I don't understand it myself. I only know that God has told me I must do this, and so I must. God has a plan. I don't know what it is, but I know that God has a plan and that somehow all these things will work together for good if we believe. Oh, son, please don't look at me with those big, dark Sarah eyes. Close your eyes, my son, and know that God loves you and that I love you. Trust, my son, trust. So this is the moment, God. It's come down to this moment. This is the test, and I will meet it. But if I'm wrong, if it's not your voice, God, that I heard, please be merciful and take my life. One deep breath, just one deep breath to settle the strength into my soul, and then, oh God, it will be done. One deep breath and a ram. A ram there in the bush, a ram. God be praised, a ram, an offering in place of Isaac. Thank you, God. Now, if we were honest with ourselves, we would have to admit that the kind of God we would like to have is one who blesses us and asks nothing hard of us, at least not real difficult things. But as Abraham found out, there is more to God than just that. We don't really know for sure why God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son. What we do know is that God gave Abraham the very disturbing command to take his son to a distant hill and to sacrifice him. Now back in the time of Abraham, Sacrificing the oldest child was unfortunately a common practice among various other religions. However, it was not a common practice for God. Scripture is very clear that God was against murder and the sacrifice of any human being. And frankly, this demand of God did not make sense. It would seem to put an end to the promise that God had made in the first place, that Isaac would be the father of a great nation. What in the world was God doing? But even though Abraham didn't see that God was making any sense, Abraham still acted on what God commanded him to do. And from that understanding, Abraham came to a deeper understanding that God can be trusted, even when God seems to ask the impossible, even when God's plan doesn't seem to make any sense. Abraham learned that when the chips are down, God is there for us. Most of us, I would say all of us, don't like to be tested. But here in this story, we see that it's only when we allow ourselves to be pushed to the limit that we really come to discover 
something about ourselves and something about God that we never knew before. Maybe this time of the COVID virus has been so for you. And maybe there have been a plethora of other experiences during these four to six months that have also put you to the test. After Abraham went through this ordeal with Isaac, what Abraham found out about God is that God can be trusted. And this service served to reinforce the faith that Abraham had in God. Now, faith isn't a matter of knowing the right words or believing the right things or even always feeling comfortable with God. But it is a matter of putting our trust in God and then living like we really mean it, trusting that God will provide. Faith is obeying God, even when we don't understand what God wants of us or what God is doing. And frequently God doesn't make sense. All we have to do is look at the scripture to know that. God is a God who tells an old man to kill his son. God is a God who takes a ragtag bunch of Jewish slaves and uses them to save the world. God is a God who sends his own son to earth to hang out with prostitutes and thieves, to wash dirty feet, and then to become the sacrifice for the world. God is a God who uses 12 uneducated misfits to take his gospel to all the nations. There are times when God does not stop the hand. There are times when there seems to be no angel crying, wait, stop, there's a ram over there. When there's no last minute reprieve, what then? Can we, can you, can I still trust God when it is someone we love who is dead, killed by a drunk driver? When it is our spouse who is consumed by cancer? When a loved one is lost to the disease of Alzheimer's or dementia? When it is someone who we love who is crushed by memories of abuse, when we find a pink slip with our paycheck, when our parents die, leaving us with unexpected uh, expectations unmet, issues unresolved, memories incomplete, can we still trust God when the doctor shuts the door to the room with no smile on her face, and we know the news is not good. Can we still trust God when we come home to an empty house after years of laughter with only bittersweet memories lingering in the air and the taste of lawyers and judges sour in our mouth? When it is our hope that goes unfulfilled, our prayers that seem to go unanswered, can we still trust God even then? Yes. Yes, we can. Abraham did. Before he set out on his journey carrying the wood, fire, and knife, Abraham trusted God. He had to have or he would not have gone. On the third day of their travel, Abraham looked up and saw the place, and he said to his servants, Stay here. The boy and I will go worship, and then we will come back to you. Not I will come back to you. We will come back to you. And Isaac said to his father, here's the wood and here's the fire, but where's the lamb? And Abraham said, God will provide. And they walked on together. Abraham had no idea how this would end. Neither do we with our lives. We never know, never. 
where the journey leads, what will happen, or if there will be a ram caught in the thicket by its horns, or if it will only be us caught on the horns of a dilemma, trapped between a rock and a hard place, wondering, waiting, praying, even wandering. But some way, always, there is a ram caught in the thicket. The ram may be simply the faith to continue to go on when all our dreams are lost. The ram may be the hope and peace in the midst of pain and loss. God always provides the ram that we need. Our challenge is to trust, to trust that God is good, good beyond measure, better than we can ever imagine, and to trust that if God calls us to go to the mountain, that God will be with us there. The question is, what is God calling you and I to do? What is your Isaac that God is asking you to trust God with? How are you asked to trust God for the spiritual guidance and vision? The truth is we live in a broken world and the only response to this broken world is to trust God. When God dares to call us to do what seems impossible, trust in God. Lean on each other hard for support and hope and love. There are times that we need the tangible evidence of God's love and trustworthiness. Receive today God's gift of goodness, mercy, grace, love, hope, and peace as you interact with the folks here in this sanctuary, as those of you at home go about your daily activities. When you can, give and take a million hugs, a million smiles, a million touches to give you what you need to know that God is with you and present with you. Know that in the days to come, our God is a God who can be trusted. Praise the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us affirm our faith as we recite together the Apostles' Creed found in your bulletin. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God loves to hear from us, us the joys and concerns on our hearts, even though he already knows them. Uh, Richard and I had a wonderful trip last week to Virginia Beach. We kind of blew in in the middle of a tropical storm, but once that passed, by Tuesday, the weather was gorgeous and the beach was not terribly crowded and we had a, a great time taking walks and um, just relaxing and soaking up the sun. So it was good to get away and it's also good to be back. I want to mention that um, Peggy Dyerly is having surgery tomorrow, so please keep her in your prayer. And her husband Norris is still struggling, very weak, um, and um, also Peggy's sister um, had a, a heart attack and is uh, recovering from that. So lots of prayers for that family. Let us now turn our hearts to God in prayer. Loving and gracious God, you created this world good. And through 
giving us choice that we could love you or not, sin and evil entered this world, and it is now a broken world. With diseases like coronavirus, <clears throat> cancer, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, asthma, arthritis, even a common cold or a sore back or a simple headache can make life feel miserable. Lord, these have not been easy days in this world with a virus spreading at a rapid pace and scientists struggling to catch up, to figure out how to treat it, how to get ahead of it, how to keep very sick people alive. There's also a mystery that people can have it and not show any symptoms and be a carrier passing those along to other folks. Lord, we just ask that some wisdom, some direction and guidance will come soon on the part of the scientists who are struggling to figure out how to deal with this. Help us individually take responsibility to be aware of our distance from one another, to be willing to wear that stupid mask in Kroger when we don't want to, but when we know it might protect someone else or a loved one back home, to be willing to wash our hands and to practice all kinds of good hygiene be with us and give us patience, Lord, as we continue to live with this virus that does not seem to want to go away and probably never will. There are so many folks who are working on the front line, taking care of others, taking them to the hospital, nursing them at home, running errands. We just ask that you would give them uh, stamina, endurance, protect them with good immunity that they don't get sick themselves, protect their families that they don't bring home any illnesses. Lord, bless all those who are in a variety of kinds of ministries in responding to the many needs during this time. It does the heart good to see good stories of people collecting items and distributing them, or having parades and celebrating birthdays or the life of a loved one. Help us to continue to be creative, Lord, in how we reach out to our neighbors, to our friends, to our family, to others that need that human touch, for we are a human being. Be with us as we struggle with this disease in the midst of all the, of the other things that are going on in life. Finances and relationships, uh, challenges and decisions. Just give us wisdom and to know that you are in it. Even when you ask us to do the very difficult things like forgiving others or giving up something we desperately want to hang on to. Help us to know that we can trust you and that you are with us. Lord, this country is experiencing civil unrest and other countries are experiencing events of terrorism and war, abuse of other people. Forgive us, Lord, for our pride, for our arrogance, for our anger, Help us to be willing to sit down and have conversations with folks so that we can understand their perspective before we share our own. Bring peace again to this earth. Help Christ's example of loving and compassionate care of others guide us in our everyday events and steps. Be with this congregation, Lord, as we um, continue to search for the next pastor you have called. Bless the search committee that is working so very hard. 
that they might hear your voice and have a sense of assurance of where you're leading and guiding them. Continue to bless all the ministries and the leadership of this congregation as well. And hear us now as we lift our voices, asking the prayer that, our son, that your son taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Before we have our hymn, I'm going to ask Liz if she would come forward. I don't see her at the moment. There she is. Um, to share a little bit of an update, should have done this during the announcements, but that's all right, um, as to what the uh, pastor search committee is doing, process-wise. Hello, um, is this on? No, okay. Hello, I'm just coming to you from the Pastor Nominating Committee just to let you all know where we're at in our process. Um, it's been a long process. We've had to throw COVID in between it. We're working very closely with Presbytery right now on what our next steps are because they don't know either. We're trying to figure out a new normal. But I can tell you that the nine of us have read and read and read PIFs, which are pastor information forms. As we read these and we discern over them and we pray about them, we rank them. If they rank well enough among nine of us, we start listening to sermons. Some of us listen to sermons as we're reading them. Um, we will listen anywhere from one to three sermons per candidate. As these candidates keep moving, we then send them another set of questions that they respond back to us. Some answer us. Some don't. Some send back saying, we don't think we're ready for Quaker. It's not, our, not where we need to be. Um, some of the questions come back, and us as, can, as the PNC go, this candidate's not ready for us. So it is a process. We have learned how to Zoom, which has been great, and we've done some Zoom interviews with candidates. And we are now working with Presbytery on what our next steps will be. How do we bring candidates in to interview? How do we go and see a sermon from somebody when most churches are still closed or only allowing so many people in and a PNC can't go in and take over a church? So we're learning, but the biggest thing that the PNC is asking for is prayer. Um, we have met every Monday night. Some weeks we've met three times a week. Um, so we really need prayer um, just to keep us going. Um, that God is calling, we know there's a person out there for Quaker, but we need God to really show us and, and lay it, say, here it is. And um, we need your prayer. So the biggest thing I would like to ask is that definitely on Monday nights around 630, maybe right before you're getting ready to eat dinner, maybe after you've had dinner, stop and pray for the nine of us on PNC. We need it. And... During the week, if they pop in your head, please pray for us because it's not just a two-hour meeting on Monday night that we're doing. We put a lot of time into it, and we know God has the perfect candidate for us, and he's going to show it to you, and he's going to say, hey, guys, here it is, and we can't wait to bring you the news of when that happens. So thank you. Thank you.
As we exit from this sanctuary, there are uh, offering plates in the back for you to put your envelopes into, and we give you thanks for all the folks who have been either uh, bringing in or mailing in um, their support. The finances continue, and they've been being met, and we do appreciate very much your doing that. Join with me now the prayer of dedication of the offering that's printed in your bulletin. Voice in the wilderness, lamb upon the tree, wind carrying the word of salvation to the world, you who are the one in three, thank you for calling us by name, for providing for our needs, for freeing us to live in union with Christ. We offer to you what you have given to us in joy, with love for the common good. Bless gifts, givers, and receivers, so that we can give you our richest praise in the name of Jesus Christ the Lord. Amen.
and you can trust God with your life, with your loved ones, with all that is about you. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord look with favor upon you and give you peace, now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>